Hey guys, I'm uh, really excited to talk about a project that I worked on recently where we scaled our sort of existing data pipeline into Fargate uh, and give you a little overview of sort of that process, give you some background on who we are, the data pipelines that we have, uh, some of the goals around how do we evaluate what the new technology that we are using should be, uh, give you some of the other solutions we looked at before we landed on Fargate, and overall just talk about our experience working on Fargate. Um, and some quick background on who we are. Life360 is a mobile app for families. We keep them safe, communicate, and coordinate throughout the day. You can see where your family is on a map. We've got 20 million users using it every single day. Uh, we're number five in the US social networking uh, category. And we've got a lot of data coming in. We've got billions of API requests every single day. Uh, and we've got a team based in San Francisco. Uh, and don't worry, this is the, the last I'm going to pitch you on the company, but just giving you a sense of all the data that's coming in. Uh, and you know, we've got this data pipeline coming from our users, and they're, they're taking events, and they're doing actions, and, and we need to use that to build the home screen app for every family. I want every family in the world uh, to be using Life360, and so how do we do that? It's by seeing how our users are using the app, how often they're engaged, what are all the things that they're doing in the app so that the product and data teams can uh, make decisions based on that. Uh, and we're processing uh, over a billion events coming in per day. It's actually growing very, very quickly. Uh, our existing previous system was using a third-party vendor. It was SDK-based uh, for a whole host of reasons. It wasn't any longer scalable for the scale that we're at, so we decided to bring it in-house, uh, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. Uh, and I'm not going to pitch you on Docker or containers or bore you with a lot of code, uh, but I did put up an example project that you can check out on GitHub if you want. Uh, and I'm going to quickly go through the code just at a very high level so that you understand what the different moving parts are. But don't worry, I'm not trying to lull you into sleep in uh, this early afternoon talk. Uh, and the real high level architecture is we've got mobile clients. They're sending us a bunch of data. Uh, we want to receive that uh, through a load balancer. Uh, we want to be able to process it and return uh, sort of success or not immediately to the clients. Uh, and then we want to pass it off to a messaging queue to do much more interesting work with it. Uh, and so just keep this in mind as, as we're talking about the architecture. Uh, I used Go to build out all the examples that you'll see. And again, don't try to understand this all up front. Um, but we just start a server, and this is what we connect to the ALB. Um, the important thing is to make sure that you listen to signals that you receive so that you can cleanly close out your containers when uh, Fargate sends a signal. Uh, and again, we're just processing stuff and dumping it into a queue. Uh, and one of the interesting things that I just want to point out is we turn everything into a JSON object that looks like the same sort of JSON object that you would see through Lambda or SQS or S3 if they posted directly to your service. And the reason we do this is so that in the back sort of secondary services, you can receive it as if it was coming from Lambda or ALB or something uh, and not have to switch it up specifically for that. Uh, and then on the other side, we've got something that's listening in for those messages coming through the queue uh, and, and processing them and, and you know, doing useful work on it, which we actually call do useful work, which in the example is just sleeping for 10 seconds. But you literally could do whatever useful work you wanted to do with this data that's coming through. Uh, and it's all the standard Docker stuff. So if you're familiar with Docker, it should be really easy to get into the example. Uh, one thing I want to point out here is we take a lot of care to make sure that the Docker container is as small as possible. There's a, a whole host of reasons why that's good. Um, so we actually build it separately and then copy it into a different container. So uh, cool tricks you can hopefully pick up from the GitHub examples. Uh, and then you know it's just your standard Docker Compose that you've probably seen millions of times. So that's the code. Now how do we run that code? Because at the end of the day, I want my guys thinking about the code that they want to write and not necessarily the infrastructure that it takes it to run that code. Uh, and so that's talking about some of our goals. We want this to be scalable to billions of events. We're at a billion plus today. We want to be at 10 billion next year. Uh, so how do we build something that's truly scalable, highly available? It has to be cost efficient. So when you're a freemium consumer company like we are, we talk about things on the orders of small cents per user per month. Uh, and so we don't have a lot of money to spend on AWS. Sorry, guys. Uh, and how do we keep the management minimal. Like I want, again, 
my goal is to get my guys writing code and not necessarily dealing with instances and figuring out how do I run this code that I've written. And, and we have a very sort of service-owned architecture where the people that are writing the code are also responsible for that code, uh, and making sure that their microservice is working and dealing with issues that come up. And so the less management that uh, our engineers have to have on this code that they've written, uh, the better off we are. And because I wrote this project, it has to be easy enough that a president understands it, which, to be honest, is not a whole lot. So, uh, you know, that's kind of the goals and metrics that I'm looking for in uh, different ways to run the code. So let's look at some of these solutions that we used uh, when we did this. Uh, we did take a look at Lambda. It was actually the first thing that I took a look at. It's clearly very awesome. I think serverless is, is a really interesting concept. Uh, no maintenance or overhead. You just write some code and you run it. That's really cool, very scalable, highly available. Some of the things we did see was the cold start problem. And if you're not familiar with that, uh, it, it certainly has gotten better on AWS. But there are still instances where certain requests just have really long times. And you know, your 95th percentile might look good, but your 99th is really impacted by the, the cold starts. Um, also, especially when it comes to cost, your only really logging option is CloudWatch. And um, needless to say, when you're running billions of requests, uh, especially for our use case where there's a fair amount of sleeping waiting for other providers, uh, the costs with logging get pretty out of control. Um, and it's, it's not the most cost uh, efficient method. Uh, another thing is we've got a container. We've already built this container. Let's just launch it on some instances, and uh, that's how we'll scale. Uh, the problem there is it really gives you a lot of control over the stack. It is very cost efficient. You're only paying for what you're using. Uh, but then all of a sudden, the goal around having engineers just write some code and run it is no longer the dream. Uh, they're there watching all the different instances, setting up auto scaling. It's, it's definitely not hitting the goals around zero maintenance. Uh, you can talk about orchestration and doing really cool stuff with EKS or ECS. Uh, certainly, that's a very attractive thing. You can set up auto scaling. It, it really takes over that orchestration part, which is sort of the hardest part of uh, Kubernetes to understand. Uh, you get some still control over the boxes. You can SSH into your containers. Uh, it is cost efficient. Um, but it is still overly complex compared to what I want. I don't want someone to really have to understand all of Kubernetes to really be able to launch some code that they've written. Uh, and it certainly wasn't easy enough for me. I still can't claim to know everything about Kubernetes, uh, so I, I won't claim that at all. Uh, so let's go ahead and look what Fargate uh, does and how, how it works on Fargate. Um, and so I, again, just giving you an overview of the architecture we set up. Uh, we want this service that accepts from an ELB and passes it off to a messaging queue. Uh, and then we have a, a separate service that sort of consumes it. Uh, and um, uh, one other quick thing I wanted to point out uh, is there is an awesome CLI that uh, AWS manages that really makes it super easy to inter integrate with Fargate. Uh, I'm not going to take you through a bunch of examples of typing commands into the command line, because that's not very interesting. Um, but definitely check that out. Instead, what I do want to walk you over is sort of the high-level concepts that you need to have when you're interacting with Fargate. Uh, and the three high-level concepts are clusters, services, and tasks. And I'll go into sort of the things to keep in mind for all of those. Uh, and one of the really cool things when you set up a cluster, and it's not immediately obvious what a cluster does, when it comes to Fargate, it's just around basically a collection of services. So you don't even really need to worry about it. But the really cool thing that Fargate does is take care of a lot of the more complicated networking stuff that you traditionally have to worry about in Docker that's just too much of a pain in the butt. Uh, so go ahead and create a, a cluster, and that's about as interesting of an exercise as it gets. Uh, and inside of that, you'll be able to create tasks which can run in services. So tasks are kind of the main thing that you need to worry about when you're thinking about Fargate. And the best thing to think about tasks, here we can create a Fargate one. You can also create an EC, uh, ECS one as well. I always confuse ECS and EC2, so forgive me if I uh, mistakenly put it the wrong way. But the really cool thing is you can run Fargate, which is sort of this auto-managed thing that takes care of containers for you. At the same time as you can run ECS uh, or tasks as well, which do give you that more fine-grained control that some developers want. 
And so this all looks like the standard stuff that you would put into a Docker Compose file. It is, you know, you give it all of the things that you care about, you name it, uh, you add some things like where the Docker Hub image lives, uh, you can give it CPU and, and actually give the command that runs that you want to run in your container. Uh, and then you can, you know, add other containers and do all sorts of cool things. And, you know, here you can see inside of this one uh, task, we're running two different containers. Um, and again, we just create the task, and then we can create services. And services are responsible for taking those tasks, which are really just that useful work that you want to do, and scaling them. So a service sort of contains your tasks and will scale scale your tasks. So inside of the service, you know, again, you just tell it what task you're trying to run, uh, how many of them you want. You can connect it directly into an application load balancer so you can have it come in from the application load balancer and you can do service discovery and you can do other things like scaling it based on the number of ALB requests that are coming in. You can also choose to scale it based on memory and CPU. Uh, and then, you know, once you have your service, it will launch tasks and they'll run and you live this awesome world where you just create a container and AWS manages it for it for you and, and makes it run and starts the tasks and gets it going. Uh, and it gives you all sorts of cool metrics. This isn't from production, but, you know, you can see memory, you can see CPU and all that sort of fun stuff. But actually bringing it into the real world, here you can see our real world stats around using Fargate. Uh, at peak, we're seeing about 150 million requests come in every single hour. Uh, if you do the math on it, it's uh, you know, tens of thousands every second, and Fargate's able to auto scale up and down, uh, more or less based off of the scale that you have, which is really awesome. Uh, and it's able to do it with a relatively uh, stable sort of response time. Um, on that. And so you can see here, even though we're scaling up pretty drastically and, and going down pretty uh, dramatically as well, uh, we're staying within 10 to 12 and a half uh, milliseconds response time for the clients, which is obviously a big concern for us when we've got a lot of traffic coming through. We don't want to spend a lot of time uh, waiting on the wire. Uh, and so let's look at the goals that we set and how Fargate sort of hits those. Uh, there's very little maintenance and overhead. You have to sort of understand what tasks are and what services are. Um, but that's really it. You're not concerned about what instances. You're not concerned about upgrading. You're not concerned about, oh, shoot, there's a new uh, Kubernetes patch that I need to get deployed to all my meta instances. Uh, it's very highly scalable and available. Uh, and it is cost efficient for a whole bunch of different uh, workloads. Some of the complaints that I still have um, that are also, in some cases, positives, there's not a lot of different auto-scaling options. As far as I could tell, it's really only memory CPU or number of ALB requests coming in. For example, for our sort of consumer that's reading in messages from a messaging queue, it'd be awesome if we could scale that service based off of how, how much depth we've got in the queue. So uh, certainly, I would love to have other ways to scale this thing. Um, logging is still a bit of a pain with CloudWatch being sort of the preferred way, but you know, my. My comments around CloudWatch aside, uh, it's all right. Uh, and then the really cool thing uh, that I think is a bit of a negative for a lot of people that try Fargate for the first time is, what do you mean you can't exec into Fargate and see what's going on my, on my Docker instance? Uh, but I do think it's actually both a positive and a negative because it gives you that discipline around, well, actually, when you have thousands of these uh, containers running, you can't SSH into any single one to really diagnose anything. But if you do feel that need, or if there is a problem you do want to diagnose, I, I do think it was a very incredibly smart move to both be able to launch Fargate containers alongside of ECS containers so that you could have best of both worlds. Uh, and so with that, I'll leave it open to questions. Just try to clarify, you're running serverless, right? Uh, I guess technically it's serverless, but I'm pretty sure when it's serverless, that's referring to Lambda primarily. So here, you're not worried about servers. You're not right. worried about instances. You're not worried about anything server-related. I don't know if AWS calls it serverless or not. It's kind of a happy medium between EKS and serverless, where you get to run a container. It is your normal Docker container you would build. And then you just give it to AWS to manage and scale for you. So do, do you have uh, any uh, um, uh, initial stigma of uh, crossing that uh, barrier, try to uh, re uh, relinquish all your control over the bare metal hardware. 
it is a hard thing for a lot of people to give up that control around being able to exec into their container or SSH into their box. I think when you're doing something at massive scale where there's billions of things happening, uh, you shouldn't be trying to solve individual problems by SSHing into your box. And so in order to do something at massive scale, you have to eventually give up that control because no matter what you do at that scale, there will be issues. And so you should solve them without SSHing into boxes and be able to solve it at scale. So uh, reading between the lines, uh, uh, am I uh, thinking that uh, you're endorsing uh, the, uh, the philosophy in order to continue to grow uh, linearly or exponentially, you're willing to uh, 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 relinquish the control over the hardware? I wouldn't necessarily say it's about relinquishing control. Uh, what it is about is being able to scale efficiently without hiring a DevOps team of 100. And so what we've done is set up this thing where the people that are making the services are also responsible for running those services. So we do have a very awesome and talented DevOps team, but they're focused on building tools and automation, not about SSHing into boxes and, and running into issues. Um, and so that is our goal. At the end of the day, the way you scalably scale something is not to have a 100 infrastructure engineers worried about thousands of boxes. It's about building tools and automation and, in some cases, giving up control. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah, architecturally, what is under Fargate? What's below Fargate? Sorry, what was that? Architecturally, what is below Fargate? Yeah, so uh, that is implementation details left up to AWS. So really, what you're saying is, hey, AWS, I've got this container. It needs two CPUs and four gigs of memory. Run this container. And, and that's all that you really have to worry about. So uh, right now, it may be something, but it's sort of completely transparent to you uh, so that you don't have to worry about that. You're not doing architecture-specific decisions that might change when Fargate upgrades. And, and that's the really cool thing here, where something like EKS or if you're running Kubernetes or some other sort of orchestration yourself, you're actually managing these boxes. And you have to worry about, like, oh, there's a new version of Kubernetes. Let me go like upgrade all of my boxes. Here, Fargate is, doing, is abstracting that all away from you and is instead saying, like, trust me to run this container code for you, uh, and I'll, I'll choose whatever machines or instances that it needs to run on as long as you're hitting your auto-scaling requirements. Oh, sorry. I'll get you. Don't worry. Yeah, how do you charge for this? Is that per container that's running, or is that... You know, uh, the CPU that's being used, uh, let's say you have thousands of yep. these running. Yeah, so when you specify a task, you specify how much uh, CPU and how much memory you want. And so it's based off of, uh, you know, basically per hourly how much CPU and memory each task is taking, and then that scales for the number of tasks that are running in your service. So, uh, you know, there is a cost per task, and then inside of a service you might have, say, 50 tasks running, so it'd be 50 times the cost of that task to run per hour, roughly speaking. Uh, but that, that's pretty much the only cost outside of your standard networking and bandwidth and all that. Oh. Yep. Hi. Hi, how the microservices uh, communicate with each other through Fargate? Yeah, so one of the things that's really cool about Fargate is it does tie into the rest of VPC, and so you get an ENI that's connected to your Fargate instance. Uh, they, Fargate does have some service discovery uh, mechanisms and all that sort of fun stuff, um, but really, like, there is an IP, and you can connect to a port that is exposed, uh, and so you can have microservices that talk to each other, and, and that very much is something we've set up where there are contracts and, and all that fun stuff around running microservices, and sort of the implementation details of those microservices are hidden from each other, and we're just talking through service discovery to IPs and ports. All right. We're going to do one more question, but then everyone else can follow up directly after. Um, if you have a little bit of time. Right here, just because I promise. Or, can you? Oh, man. <laughs> Sorry. I'll what is scaling strategy you support? What, what, that? what is the scaling strategy you support? Uh, sure. I mean, in, are you talking about in terms of auto-scaling? Or yeah, containers, how you scale? Yeah. You, you 
Yeah, so right now, as it exists, we're doing it just based off of CPU. So as CPU goes up, we start to scale it. I think that's an incredibly sort of brute force sort of way to do it and actually leads to a lot of uh, room for optimization, especially around costs. Uh, so one of the examples I gave is it would be awesome to scale on our own metrics. So for example, uh, the, the depth on a queue or if you had some other you know, metric that was important to your application, being able to scale off of those instead of just having the sort of broader memory CPU number of requests. Uh, and with that, thank you much, everyone.